what you have is a potential for a, an authoritarian response to a crisis that could end up in, in the end of democracy as we know it in the United States. The inherent power of the President of the United States to suspend the Constitution or any provisions thereof or any laws of the government when he decides it's in the national interest to do so. Giafrida, North, and George Bush began to turn FEMA into an instrument of domestic anti-terrorism. You're dealing with a group of people in the Reagan administration who equated political dissent with treason and who cannot differentiate between emergency procedures, which I think everyone agrees are necessary, and suppressing political dissent. And with North and Poindexter and Casey, you had a group of people who saw Americans who disagree with them as the enemy. I was particularly concerned, Mr. Chairman, because I read in Miami papers and several others that there had been a plan uh, developed by that same agency, a contingency plan in the event of emergency that would suspend the American Constitution, and I was deeply concerned about it. We look at the many laws which adversely affect our constitutional rights, particularly the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. A lot of these things you don't know about, but we'll tell you right now on Alternative Views. Did you know that with a stroke of a pen or phone call, all your constitutional rights can be eliminated? The prime movers in the United States power structure admit that capitalism and democracy are not compatible. We're going to talk to a lot of people about these dangers to our civil liberties. First is Chip Berlay, who is an author and investigative reporter, particularly about civil liberties. Next, we'll hear from Arthur Kanoy, a member of the National Lawyer Guild and a longtime fighter for civil liberties in the United States. John Stockwell, a former CIA officer, is very aware of the underside, the dark side of U.S. system. Ron Paul, on the banking committee of the House of Representatives, was in a good position to see how the system works as is Congressman Henry Gonzalez from San Antonio, who's also on the House Banking Committee. Former history professor from the University of Texas, Tom Philpott, who will put all of this in an historical perspective. We start with a quote from Ken Lawrence, who is a colleague of Chip Berlay. Never before have the political duties of the police on every level been so explicitly articulated so broadly connected, so well organized. It's not just high technology that has made this possible. It is also the new strategies of the permanent repression. Chip Berlay is an investigator and fighter for civil liberties. He's a member of National Lawyer Guild, and he's had a lot of uh, things written, a lot of articles about civil liberties and the Covert Action Information Bulletin, The Nation, the Chicago Sun-Times, the Boston Globe. We're going to talk on al this Alternative Views program about how the government, particularly under the Reagan administration, has studied very extensively and intensively U.S. society and figured out how to control it in times of emergency or to prevent times of emergency from coming up and then the organizations and the framework they have decided upon to use to effect this. 
And uh, it's rather scary, but very, very interesting. Uh, we have told people an uh, alternative views about the planning organizations when Reagan was governor of California. Right where they looked at society and then they came up with these things and then Reagan took all of his buddies into the national government with him when right. he became uh, president. Can you tell us about uh, how this started and what they did out there? What? CSTA? What's well, that? it actually is a uh, number of institutions and organizations in California. Uh, when uh, Ed Meese was out there and uh, Giafrida. Giafrida and uh, whose name has come up before <laughs> with FEMA and uh, also Ronald Reagan of course was governor and this was a period of great tumult on the college campuses and it was during the 60s and there was a feeling on the part of Governor Reagan that he needed to be able to control anarchy in the streets literally um, uh, and so he empowered his uh, attorney general of the state and his friends and his police force to put together in conjunction with the military a series of first exercises called uh, Lantern Spike Garden Plot. Uh, and these were a series of uh, exercises in which the military would come in and assist the civilian government in rounding up anarchists and subversives and people fighting in the streets and detain them and regain control of the state for the state authorities and these were exercises that were actually tested their game you know scenarios were written we obtained these scenarios through a series of both lawsuits and freedom of information act requests and they are explicitly a scenario operation for the mass arrest and detention of dissidents in the united states and that's what it says it says right on the documents that that's what they're planning is it possible that our government could do this sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Could our leaders, mm -hmm. could this lovable, friendly president mm -hmm. be capable of doing this sort of thing? You have to go back to the Vietnam days uh, when President Reagan was then governor of California and see what his policies were and what he did. He did call out the National Guard. Students were, in fact, shot. Uh, remember his, his famous statement in 1970 when he was asked about uh, the anti-war protests on campuses and he said if there has to be a bloodbath let's get it over with and then to make sure that people understood that he was tough and he meant it three days later he said it again if there has to be a bloodbath let's get it over with now think about this a leader of this country who is seriously proposing a bloodbath of our own young people also, there then began to set up training programs. That, like you mentioned, CSTI was a California specialized training institute. There was also set up something called the Law Enforcement Intelligence Unit. Um, CSTI, what it did was it taught local police uh, how to deal with dissidents. And its worldview is that of the far right, of reactionary authoritarianism, in which anyone who voiced dissenting opinions was a potential violent terrorist, essentially. What I found fascinating about your analysis of the philosophy of these groups is that they assumed a state of warfare, yes. that they were applying these counterinsurgency techniques right. that were developed in Northern Ireland and Vietnam and other parts of the world to U.S. society. They were assuming that U.S. society was at war and that anyone that opposed the Vietnam process a uh, program of uh, intervention in Vietnam was an enemy of right. the state and thus should be dealt with one and that they should use intelligence groups to do sure. surveillance of these organizations they should infiltrate them and they should destroy them right. as part of an enemy apparatus let's get back to this California specialized training sure. Institute because uh, to me that is such a it isn't just pure ideology we're talking about. They made a very realistic appraisal of American society, actually very Marxian appraisal of American society. And there, Geoffrey's course and doctor, uh, his, his publication that they used in studying it called uh, Civilian Violence and Terrorism. The most powerful weapon of a revolutionary is the silent, accumulating contempt and hatred of a people directed at the government or another segment of the class structure. This thesis is magnified considerably when the form of government is capitalistic 
and class-ridden. CSTI textbook. They looked at American society and said, said okay, this is a society which is uh, the upper class which rules and the lower classes get screwed. And they don't like it. With the exception of the mentally deranged or the intoxicated person, all acts of illegal criminal violence have roots somewhere in our present social, economic, or political environment. And it's a racist society. And the people of color get screwed, and they don't like it. The racially segregated segments have emerged with periods of sporadic violence. So long as the white man remains superior in numbers, he will be the repressor and the constant target of the mad dog. For these minority elements, any steps to prevent violence which do not address the issues of fundamental social and political change are destined to be irrelevant and fated to failure. It's a patriarchal society and the women are getting the short end of the stick and they don't like it so they're going to struggle. So because there are so many dissatisfied people having good reason to be dissatisfied, that means we these people will try to better their condition. Legitimate violence is integral to our form of government, for it is from this source that we can continue to purge our weaknesses. Illegal violence has roots which are attached to emotional situations of political, economic, or social inequality. That means that the government we are in the, in society and the ruling class will have constant uh, competition and people struggling against it so there is permanent insurgency and because there is permanent insurgency we need to have permanent state oppression boy when i well, read that it actually just, what uh, they said you have to have permanent counterinsurgency which can take the form of state repression when necessary and because no one wants to get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, let's go out and repress dissent, dissent today. You know, they have to characterize it in terms that they can internalize and live with. I think it's important to understand that because people don't get up in the morning and say, well, I'm an FBI agent and I have to ensure that the oligarchic economic interests of America succeed once again in screwing the masses. Because, you know, you're not going to do that. The average no. person isn't going to do that. But when the people who are, are the prime people in this organization look at society, they look at it very realistic. Oh, sure. Now, well, then they can they can go out with this their ideology internal, from them. Uh, right. This is this is uh, internal right. consumption. Right. But they're looking at society, and then they say. Well, that's an accurate appraisal of American society. Right. Right. Absolutely, and they're looking. That's what's scary. They're looking at the American society very realistically, and they then they come up with these ways to have repression of the people who are struggling to get a better to uh, normalize it and to get a bigger share of the prize. What's different and here so, though, and, and this is where Ken Lawrence and I sometimes disagree, but it's a disagreement over one percent of whereas we agree on ninety nine percent is is this is the character of this understanding different uh, and, and thus, are the techniques different, or is this merely a continuation? Um, Ken, I think, says that it's a new state repression, as he says in his articles, where the understanding that this permanent state of insurgency requires a permanent state of counterinsurgency has changed the battle. Um, I'm not so sure. I, there's evidence on both sides of this, and I, mean, you know, I don't think it really matters. And we're sort of fiddling over hairs here. Um, what I say is that if you look at the Molly Maguire's, uh, as, uh, as, a, as a paradigm, I mean, th what you had there were the mine owners seeing a permanent state of insurgency and thus putting in permanent counterinsurgency people into them to provoke violence and then round up the people who they trapped. As early as the 1880s or? Oh, yeah, in the, in the 1800s, 1800s, definitely, sorry. as early as. And, and you see similar things going on. I can go back to the Bible and talk about slipping people into the city to see what's going on, you know. However, I, I think Ken has a good point that what happened in an industrialized society uh, in a global economy is that this took on a new character in terms of technique. And this I agree with him wholeheartedly, that the techniques that began to be used were much more sophisticated than merely putting agents and informants in place and putting in agents provocateurs. And what they said was that uh, analyzing the 50s, 60s struggles and all, they said that the problems that they had then was that they let the
what you have is a potential for an authoritarian response to a crisis that could end up in, in the end of democracy as we know it in the United States. The inherent power of the President of the United States to suspend the Constitution or any provisions thereof or any laws of the government when he decides it's in the national interest to do so. Gia Frida, North. Same agency, a contingency plan in the event of emergency that would suspend the American Constitution, and I was deeply concerned about it. We look at the many laws which adversely affect our constitutional rights, particularly the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. And George Bush began to turn FEMA into an instrument of domestic anti-terrorism. You're dealing with a group of people in the Reagan administration who equated political dissent with treason and who cannot differentiate between emergency procedures, which I think everyone agrees are necessary, and suppressing political dissent. And with North and Poindexter and Casey, you had a group of people who saw Americans who disagree with them as the enemy. I was particularly concerned, Mr. Chairman, because I read in Miami papers and several others that there had been a plan uh, developed by that